far side, the water coming out of the South Bank Diversion Tunnel. As the water comes out of the diversion tunnel, it rises in a great boil of water, rising nine or ten feet up. And at this particular time, it was possible to bring a boat upriver to the bottom of the white water that you see in this picture. The flow over the, we flew over the dam site, giving a brief view of the site and works area. Back on the ground, we can see the function of the two blondins, each with its own cable and movable tower, operating from the blondin platform on the south bank enabling the eight cubic yards skips or any other equipment to be accurately placed on any part of the main dam. Work is proceeding apace after the floods and they have started to build the main dam over the undersluices. Up to now, wooden shuttering had been used, but this was now being discarded and replaced by sliding steel forms to hasten the work. As you can see here, there is a long way to go to complete the central coffer dam, as the flood season is only two months away. Work was also progressing well on the main dam outside the coffer dam. Below the Blondin platform, work is proceeding on the main intakes to the underground power station. Which you can see in this picture. By January 1958, the early floods had started and the river was rising fast. Work was proceeding inside the coffer dam, on the abutments and above the undersluices. In these pictures you can see how the blocks of the main dam were used as abutments for the central coffer dam.
the North Bank Pier of the road bridge, even at this stage, was beginning to take a battery. The flood debris you see here has come down the river and presented the main hazard when proceeding upriver by boat to service the flood warning station at Sengwa, 50 miles upstream. The flight over the works area provides a good general view. The coffer dam is ready for the onslaught of the floods and the works area geared to go ahead with concreting at full speed. The consultant's offices have a fine view over the dam and works area. Kariba Heights Hotel was under construction with a fine swimming bath at the rear, which was very necessary and very popular throughout the year. By February the 10th, 1958, the flood was still rising rapidly, was more to come. The cyclone, which had travelled up the north bank of the Zambezi, had settled in the west of what was then northern Rhodesia, now Zambia, over the Barotsi Plain as a low pressure area, but still resulting in he very heavy rains. The flood at this time was over the blocks, forming the undersluices. The north pier of the road bridge was again in trouble and when it collapsed, the whole bridge went with it. But now real trouble started as the low pressure area started to move south and then east along the Zambezi River adding to the already high flood and also bringing the tributaries down in flood in turn, further increasing the high flood. proceeded inside the coffer dam up till the last minute and six foot of concrete plus sandbags were placed along the upstream side of the coffer dam.
the final build-up of the catastrophic flood started about March the 1st. The Sunyati River was already a small lake and the Kariba aerodrome was underwater. The flood was covering the blocks in the old North Bank coffer dam, but work continued on the next block above the flood and on ancillary works such as the access road to the dam on the South Bank. Where a bulldozer was pushing earth off the top of a very high bank. Although the coffer dam had been raised six feet, the final flood was eight foot over it. The noise here had to be heard to be believed, with great bubbles of air being trapped by the, the water and bursting. As you see, the dam officers are in danger and, in fact, were washed away the following day. Water was beginning to come over the top of the raised coffer dam. The footbridge was in trouble and rock gabions were used to try to prevent the North Bank Tower from being outflanked. The decking of the footbridge had been pulled up until it was resting against the suspension cables. All to no effect, as the flood peaked on March the 8th with 570,000 cubic feet per second passing the dam site. By March the 10th, the flood was subsiding and the damage could be seen. The dam offices had been washed away together with the two bridges. However, by June 1958, the coffer dam had been repaired and pumped dry. In the meantime, work had gone on a pace outside the coffer dam and extensive work carried out in the works area. The undersluices had been covered over and the pontoons from the, co the old coffer dam construction had been placed on the highest block and the contractors christened them Noah's Ark and said they were up there ready for the next floods.
These Blondin skips each have a capacity of eight cubic yards. During September, work began on the final closure by filling in the undersluices above the water level at that time. And to give a quick run through the works area, in the quarry are the wagon drills preparing for blasting. Excavators then load the rock onto tippers, which deliver it to the hopper at the main crusher. While we were there, a six foot by three foot rock jammed in the crusher and had to be loosened when once again the huge crusher looked as if it was chewing up peanuts though huge rocks were being fed into it. From the crusher anything over 8 inch was sent to the secondary crushers and the aggregate added to the stockpile. At this time, work was proceeding on the main dam at about 2,000 cubic yards of concrete per day. In the background, you can see the main intakes to the power station. And here in the works area, you see the banks of cement storage bins and the two batching plants from which the concrete is taken in specially made transporters to the loading bay. Where it is transferred to the Blondin skips and taken out to where it is required on the work. As the one skip goes out, the next one comes in. And the actual time taken is not much different from the time it takes to tell you about it. This goes on day and night. The dam requires heavy reinforcing of the piers between the spillway openings. And most of the reinforcing that you see in these pictures is one and a quarter inch diameter. Work on the main wall within the, co the old coffer dam is catching up with the rest. The bridges have been replaced As you see in this general view, the remains of the old coffer dam were left in place and in the foreground you will see the sand washing plant on the south bank. Sand from here was supplied to the north bank works area via a cableway. A clever adaptation for the new road bridge was to use the end blocks of the main dam as anchors for a suspension bridge.
By November 58, the top of the dam is now leveling up and was nearing full height except at the flanks. Trouble was expected on the south bank abutment. But after pumping in thousands of pockets of cement as grout, the foundations were opened up and it was found that there was a mud seam which had to be which had been missed in the investigations. The problem was overcome by constructing buttresses down onto sound rock. In these pictures, you can see the extensive scouring of the river sides and bed caused by the extremely high flood. Preparatory to the final closure, heavy steel grills were placed in front of each undersluice with a concrete capping just wide enough for tippers to back down onto the block and dump their load where it was required. A good reserve of material was also placed opposite the grills. On December the 2nd, the great day arrived to close off the undersluices and start filling the lake. Mrs. Shand raced up to Kariba at short notice the night before and was ready on site at 7.30 to get these pictures of the event. It was necessary to place coarse, then fine, then very fine material to restrict the flow almost to nothing to effect a closure. And to enable the undersluice to be blocked with concrete and finally grasped in position. First it was necessary to build up a causeway to fill the short gap between the block and the hillside to enable the tippers to drive onto the block and to ensure that there was ample material at all times, an emergency quarry was opened up a short distance upstream. The loaded tippers had to pack, had to back in tandem onto the top of this block and dump their loads over the edge where required. If this was not possible, they dumped their load on the block and it was pushed over the bulldozer, which seemed to appear from nowhere.
This was the first motorboat on Little Lake Kariba. And so the process continued night and day. The consultant staff took soundings along the upstream side and we in the hydrological branch took gaugings downstream to determine where the material should be dumped. Finally, very fine material was dumped from the conveyor belt operating across the front of the grills. By January 1959, Final closure had been effected and the two lower compensation pipes were in operation to keep the river flowing downstream of the dam. It was now into the rainy season and difficulties were being experienced with heavy loads getting through on the muddy road. By June 59, work was proceeding on the tail races from the powerhouse. At the dam, they were waiting for the water to rise to the level of the bank of compensation pipes and in time to the six spillway gates above. In the great heat in the gorge, the most popular place to work was within the spray from the lower compensation pipes. Even the swallows enjoyed flying through and through under the jets. And now the dam is almost up to road level throughout, except on the south bank where the buttresses were having to be installed. Some very heavy loads had to be transported to site on special low loaders. Here you see a transformer weighing 120 tons on its way. The Great Kariba Dam was opened on May 17, 1960 by Her Royal Highness the Queen Mother. The pictures were taken in slow motion because of the poor light under the canopy. Sir Duncan Anderson, Chairman of the Federal Power Board, accompanied Her Majesty the Queen Mother onto the dais and made the opening speech, followed by Her Majesty, who, after her speech, operated a button to start up the first turbine and generator. Sir Malcolm